Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a very special episode because this is an episode that I thought about while being sick. And I still sort of am sick, but I'm much better than yesterday. <clears throat> I came down with the old corona, which I didn't even know that was a thing anymore in 2023. But sure enough, my uh, old man got back from uh, the Middle East. He went to go visit some family in Jordan. And um, I went to go see him because it has been like a month and a half since I had seen him. And apparently being on the airplane, he contracted corona and gave it to everyone in the family. So, um, I've been out of commission for a little bit. But while I was out of commission, I was <clears throat> uh, binging some old videos that I haven't really watched. Uh, or maybe I watched a couple from this person's channel and then just never watched the rest of what she put out. But her name is Amy Loves Perfume. That's her YouTube channel. She has some outrageous hauls from about nine, eight, seven, six, five years ago. Um, and her hauls are unbelievable, like hundred bottle hauls. They just go on and on and on and on. <clears throat> and I know while I was watching her video, this is my scent of the day, by the way. Uh, this is Nino Ciruti's Fair Play from 1984. And um, so this has a cap on it because this is a, a actual retail bottle. I'll show you another Nino Ciruti I wore recently that uh, did not have a cap. And while I was watching some of her videos, she was talking about how important she thought it was to have a cap, that she loves having a cap if she can. It protects the fragrance, you know, atomizer and all that stuff. And I completely understand that. But I've always been someone who went for, you know, trying to get a respectable amount of juice, even if I have to sacrifice the cap. And some of these harder to find vintage fragrances, sometimes you have to sacrifice a cap. So this video, is going to be about my headless soldiers, my fragrances in my collection that I went for that were either testers or fragrance bottles where the person lost the cap and I bought it secondhand or a swap or something like that. And um, I just thought this would be a fun video. So while most people are sick, uh, they're up in bed trying to recuperate, my recuperation is hanging out with you guys. So I do have some cough drops ready. I have a backup bottle of uh, water ready. <clears throat> so I should be good to go. However, if I did miss a fragrance in my collection, if you see later on a fragrance that did not have a cap that I forgot to include in this list, please take it easy on me uh, because I am under under the weather still officially. But I will just tell you real quick, uh, Nino Ciruti Fair Play is absolutely fantastic. One of the unsung heroes from the 80s. It's like this you know, it opens up citrus. It's a lap. It's an amber fougere is the way that I would describe it. So it has that, you know, um, barbershop lavender in the top with fresh citruses. But what's so crazy about this fragrance is just how smooth it is. I mean, it is so smooth and it has a little bit of anise that isn't listed. I pick up a little bit of an anise note, but you know how the anise in Azaro Porom is like sharp? The anise in Nino Ciruti Fair Play is so evenly smoothed out. I don't know if it's the amber vanilla in the base or whatever it is but it's so smooth but it has old school touches with pine and basil and old school carnation and stuff like that and it's this leathery mossy dry down it's just so classy i love i love uh nino ciruti's fair play okay so let's get started with my uh, headless soldier video if you will so the first one on the list is actually nino ciruti por Om, and i wore this yesterday and this is what i was wearing when i was binging amy's videos and my uh, my headless bottle that I ended up getting from Manuj. This is a very hard fragrance to find, and that's why I decided to to go with this. I'd love to have a backup that was you know full and um, you know that uh, had a cap and everything. But you know what? I'm very happy with this. This smells fresh as the day it was born. It is fantastic. Um, it's got this very uh, sprightly green opening that is a little bit bitter. And it, the, the galbanum and the way that the citruses sort of uh, come together and the sprightliness of it all reminds me a little bit of uh, Louder for Men. And if you know the way Louder for Men has that sort of sprightly green galbanum in the opening with uh, other green notes and, and oak moss in the base and furs and stuff like that, that'll give you an idea. But then imagine one of the most brilliantly made uh, masculine floral fragrances because there's an unbelievable carnation and jasmine note in here and mixed with some fruitiness there's a little bit of playfulness you know if you've ever seen the advertisement for this it's a guy hopping between almost like pillars 
with the moon in the background. His tie is sort of undone, like he just got done closing a huge deal, and it went fantastic, and the day is over, and, you know, his tie is hanging down, and he's just enjoying the night and, and, and basking in the glow of his success, right? That was the advertisement, and there's a little bit of that in here. There's a bit of seriousness and a bit of playfulness. What a fragrance. I keep going back and forth as to which one is my favorite, um, and I'm really torn, but I think I'm leaning towards the OG right now, uh, but this is a really good unsung fragrance from 1984. Fair play. Okay, so Nino Ceruti Pour Homme from 79 is the first one on the list. Now, I'm going to do a quick honorary mention because this actually did have a cap, and I ended up throwing it away because it didn't fit. It was Etienne Eigner number one, and I bought this from someone on eBay so they may have put the wrong cap on, or who knows how it happened, but whenever I would actually push the cap down to close it, it would spray the, the atomizer. Um, so it seemed like it was the right cap, but it just, it, it didn't fit. I don't know what was going on with that. But this is another unsung fragrance from 1975. Spicy, leathery, if you like those smoky, spicy, leathery scents. Um, Eigner is one of those houses that I feel was almost a canary in the coal mine house. Like whenever they would do something, other houses would pay attention and then you'd see it kind of happen um, in other houses as well. And this DNA seemed like it became very popular in the 80s as well. And this was 1975. So uh, great leather and smoky, leathery, woody, uh, spicy masculine. You know, that old school, no holds barred masculine of the 70s. Eigner number one. Honorary mention because it had a cap, but I ended up chunking it. Um, okay, next on the list is probably one of the most hated fragrances in my collection. I honestly have... I'm going to grab a little uh, a little cloth here. I honestly have no clue why I have this still. I should just wear it, review it, and sell the damn thing. Um, but this is Salvatore Ferragamo's Uomo. So... Um, Here's the thing. There are people that absolutely love this scent. I mean, rave about it. Like, 10 out of 10, this person just did like a handstand and, and uh, nailed the landing and it's just perfect. And for me, I hate it. I absolutely despise it. It's everything I hate in modern perfume. It's sweet and disgustingly, disgustingly sweet. Um... And that's one of the biggest issues is that Tonka, they say there's a tiramisu note in here. A tiramisu note. Who the hell wants to wear a tiramisu note as a man? I, um, not my thing at all, personally. But uh, I'll wear it, review it, and then sell it one of these days. The problem is I actually have to wear it to sell it. I can't stand it. Every time I've sprayed it on, especially like, because I don't want to wear it as my scent of the day. So I'll spray it on before bed, and I'll just be like, oh, geez, what... What have I done? Uh, but that is Salvatore Ferragamo's Womo. Okay, next on the list is, this is a, a really good house, very underrated house. Um, and this is Basile Womo. This is the 87 version. They actually had, I think like a 2002 and a more modern version as well. But the 87 version is the most popular among vintage collectors. There's a little bit of Paco Rabanne pour in here. But this is a Chypre. This is not a, a Fougere. So Paco Rabanne Pour Homme is a uh, Fougere. But I think because of the way the lavender and the rosemary and the top play, it will remind you a little bit of Paco Rabanne Pour Homme, but it dries down like a mossy, leathery Chypre. And this has a very interesting note of clove, blackcurrant, and galbanum in the heart with cinnamon, nutmeg, rose, and jasmine. There's some heavy patchouli in here, old school style as well. Really, um, really well done, masculine. Over, gets overlooked, but uh, I really enjoy Basile Womo. Okay, next on the list is a flanker from 89, and it's called Basile Womo Forte. Now, when I see pictures of this juice, um, it's always like clear looking. And I got this as a tester from Anuj, and this is actually one of the biggest risks of buying testers like I, like I sometimes do to, to try to be cheap and save money and get your nose on the juice, is that, you know, when air gets in the bottle, depending on how long it sits, it can obviously degrade and change the formula. And this is one of those where you can smell it in the first couple minutes of the fragrance. It's not fresh. Um, 
And but I, I still think I got a good feel of what the perfume would be. But I would love to get a fresh bottle of this that uh, maybe has never been sprayed or something like that. Yeah, he tried to commit suicide right there. He didn't like the way I was talking about him. You stay right here, buddy. You stay right there. Um, okay, so Basile Uomo Forte is kind of like this. Um, it's an interesting one because I would almost characterize it as an amber fougere of sorts. So if you've ever, um, if you've ever smelled Pierre Cardin's uh, Pour Monsieur, so uh, Pierre Cardin's Pour Monsieur from 1971, 72, early 70s, right? Uh, this one right here, Pierre Cardin's Pour Monsieur. Uh, there's a little bit of this, um, you know, amber fougere touch in uh, Basile Uomo Forte, but it's a little bit more ambery, if you will. Um, and I need to wear it more. Uh, I've only worn this once or twice, if memory serves, but um, because I bought it as a partial from Anouge. But um, definitely one to uh, keep an eye. And I think you can still find these pretty cheap. So I think this was a one run, it was a one run fragrance. So Serpy is what I'm calling the distributor, S-I-R-P-E-A, Serpy. They're, they're the only ones that basically made the fragrance. And, um, um, and then that's it. It ended up getting, uh, it ended up getting discontinued. Like it was basically a one, one run fragrance. Um, let me see if I can pull a note listing just out of curiosity. <laughs> I didn't pull up notes on each and every one of these, but let's see if I can just pull this up real quick on Basile Uomo Forte. Man, I'll tell you what, I really do like base notes, but their servers are so slow. They need to get some more servers, is what they need to do. Um, every click of their website is like five minutes of waiting. Okay, let's see. Basile Uomo Forte. Mandarin, lemon, bergamot, aldehydes, green notes, and artemisia. Carnation, cinnamon, rose, coriander, jasmine, pepper, fir, sandal, cedar. Amber, vanilla, patchouli, olibanum, cystus, and vetiver. Very interesting. Um, okay. So next on the list, we have Ball de Sarini Eau de Cologne from 2002. Now, this is a very underrated fragrance. Um, I ended up buying this one in this tester bottle because if you look right here, it says Hugo Boss. I don't know if you can see that because it's starting to rub off, but... Hugo Boss Baldessarini, because originally Baldessarini, the brand, was owned by Hugo Boss because Baldessarini was like the big boss of Hugo Boss. He was literally the boss of Hugo Boss that navigated Hugo Boss through all the rough times or great times. And um, when he retired, they ended up creating this brand that was like dedicated to him as like a dedication for all the work he did. And then they ended up spinning it off and uh, it ended up becoming its own brand. So first it was Baldessarini by Hugo Boss. Now it's Baldessarini by Baldessarini. Um, but I got this one because I knew it was an older bottle. And um, that's why I ended up buying this tester. So it's now being marketed by Mauer and Wirtz, different brand. They're more of a drugstore brand. Um, they they do um, things like, for example, uh, Tabak. This is a Mauer and Wirtz fragrance, you know, stuff like that. Um, and so I wanted to get the older bottle, but this is a very interesting fragrance because it has this bitter orange opening and spearmint with clove and cumin. And that combination will almost instantly remind you of a Jean-Claude Elena fragrance, but but it was actually made by Pierre Wargnay, one of my favorite perfumers who also did Boss Number no. 1 um, for Hugo Boss, interestingly enough, and Jean-Marc Chailin. Um, but anything Pierre Wargnay touches, I feel, is gold. And this is one that's really underrated for like a summery, spicy, woody scent. Really good stuff. Okay, <clears throat> next on the list is um, YSL's M7. Again, no cap, because this literally is a tester. It has the notes on the back, which is convenient to show. Oud, vetiver, amber, bergamot. 
And um, the first fragrance that used that oud note in the Western world, according to many, although uh, there is a uh, video of Michael Edwards, I think his name is. He's a fragrance historian or whatever you want to call him. And uh, he claims that um, that uh, Balenciaga Pour Homme from 1990 had that oud note in it. Okay, uh, next on the list of my headless soldiers is Jaipur Om. Now, the new bottles, you can tell the EDT versus the EDP because the EDP is um, almost blurry. Like, uh, see how it has this sort of... Um, See how it has this little outline right here where it the 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 glass is is tinted. It's not clear, and the EDT is completely clear, just like it is right here. It's clear all around. But the vintage bottles. This is a Boucheron distributed by Boucheron. You can see right here. Now I think it's distributed by Interparfums. Either way, Interparfums does great formulations. Oh, but um. Yeah, Jaipur Om is uh, one of the best value for money scents that you can buy. It was done by the great Anique Minardo, very underrated. She is so amazing. Uh, as far as like designers go and cheapies go, she, her and Nathalie Lorson are like the queen of cheapies. Um, powdery, spicy, oriental. Um, the EDT, I think, is a little bit more masculine. And at first, I thought I liked the EDP more. Um, but as I've sort of grown in my journey, I think I'm, I'm beginning to like the EDT more and more and more. It has a little bit more citruses and a little more spices. The cardamom's a little more prominent and the citruses are a little bit more prominent. And I really feel like this could be an all year round scent, even in the summer. I feel like I could wear this, um, but fantastic fragrance. Okay. Next on the list is a Givenchy and this is Givenchy 3. Now, this is from 1970. This version is the one from 1970. They have discontinued this. They've then re-released Givenchy 3. And, of course, the new formula is shite. I wouldn't go anywhere near it. But um, Givenchy 3 is an unbelievable, fantastic uh, green Shepra. And it takes bits and pieces from YSL's Y from 1964. The Shepra with uh, that really was the launch pad for the House of YSL in the fragrance game. Uh, there's a little bit of YSL Y in there, which makes sense. This is only six years later, which in vintage fragrance world is nothing, to be honest with you. You know, their timeline back then was much different than ours. Uh, but that's galbanum, peach, aldehydes, a huge floral heart, you know, like six or seven different type of flowers, patchouli, castorium, myrrh, just a brilliant fragrance. Okay, excuse me, I'm going to grab a cough drop real quick. We're, we're going on an early intermission because the ram is, uh, the ram is on IR. Ricola. Okay. Okay. So next on the list is the only Amouage on the list, and it's Memoir Man. And actually, I really regret buying this bottle. Not because I didn't get a good deal, because I did. I actually got a really good deal on it. Um, but it's the only Amouage in my collection <clears throat> that doesn't have a cap. And it just stands out. You know, all the other Amouages have a cap, even the ones that I have that actually are tester bottles. Like, here's a tester of uh, Dia Man. Here's a tester of Dia Man. And you can see the giant tester on the back. And uh, it even has a cap. You know? And so, um, so yes, I uh, regret the Memoir Man. I wish I would have just ponied up the extra 50 bucks or whatever it was and got the one with the cap. But, this is a great fragrance. And... It's one of Karine Vinshawn Spanner's earliest work, and I think she really knocked this out of the park. It's like uh, it's like going through a Dr. Seuss book on LSD. It is literally 
that crazy. All of the green notes just blur together. Smoky, minty. It's got the frankincense and smoke you would expect in an amouage, but it's unique and challenging. And, and the leathery sandalwood dry down in this, beautiful dry down. Just a fantastic fragrance. That was when Amouage was firing on all cylinders in 2010. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry to clear my schnoz on video. Okay, uh, next. Next on the list we have, again, a tester I think I got from Anouche. And this is um, Alain Delon Classic. So I um, uh, really like the house of Alain Delon and what he did. Um, it was Chris from Scentland who really turned me on to this, this house. Sorry for the ums and uhs because my brain and my mouth are not really synced as, uh, as, you know, being, being ill will sometimes force you to do. So I'm, I'm pausing to, to let my mouth catch up. But, um, Alain Delon Classic is the first fragrance from the house of Alain Delon in, in 1980, who was a, um, famous actor, and I'm actually going to do a celebrity fragrance uh, video uh, list one of these days. But uh, Alain Delon Classic is sort of this spicy, resinous. You know what I, I love about it, though, is that juniper lavender opening that there's this uh, sort of fresh brightness to it. And you can really get the aldehydes and the pine, and it's a, it's a very unique take on, on this DNA. And there's just a little bit of honey. And the honey comes across smelling very fresh, and it's very hard to do a fresh honey note. To me, it is. There's a lot of fragrances that try to do a fresh honey note, like, uh, for example, Cartier's L'Enval, that just come across as a little weird, you know? Like, something's a little wrong with it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this fragrance. I actually have a comparison video between this and the classic version that uh, Yol and, or Waruska and Yol put out. Um... But a Lane Delon classic is fantastic stuff. Okay, and then in 1987, they put out this little gem. And this is, again, a tester that I got from the great Anouge. And um, this is a Lane Delon Akitos. Oh. Oh, it is just, at least my sense of smell is not gone from the COVID. Um, cardamom, ginger. Mandarin orange, rose, cedar, patchouli, sandalwood, vetiver, musk, leather, and amber. And it has this sort of um, musky floral. You can really get the, the jasmine and the rose combination. And this beautiful sandalwood, but it dries down to something slightly animalic. You know, like there's some civet or maybe a touch of castorium. Or, you know, and the musk feels like a dirty, realistic musk. You know, there's... um. There's a, if you, if you know the way that the florals and poison sort of come together, there is a little bit of a similarity there because that was supposed to be poison, actually. It was just Elaine Delon sort of scooped, came in later and scooped it up and turned it into a masculine fragrance because that was the trend in the late 80s was uh, floral masculine scents. But what a fragrance, um, what a fragrance that, uh, that they created with that one. Gerard Anthony made Iquitos, by the way. Okay. Next on the list is a Guerlain. A bunch of Guerlains, actually. <laughs> Sorry to have to do that in your ear. Um, so, I didn't realize how many Guerlains I actually bought without caps. But uh, the first tester I ended up buying was uh, Jiki. And this is the Eau de Parfum. I think this is a 2017 bottle. Not 100% sure. 7U01. I think it's a 2017 batch. Um, but this is the Eau de Parfum. And this is the uh, Eau de Toilette. You can see I also got this without a cap. And um, this is sort of a um, Hesperitic Fougere. So it's got lavender, um, and it was actually the very first, it's known as sort of the very first um, fragrance that was sort of like an art, you know, it, it was it was its own smell. It wasn't a fragrance that was created to smell like a gardenia 
or a fragrance to smell like lavender or you know that kind of, that sort of thing that's what many of the fragrances were before 1889 is they would put out a fragrance and it would be like you know daisy and it was literally supposed to smell like a daisy flower or something like that right and Guerlain sort of came came along Amy Guerlain came along and with Jiki completely changed the game because it was the first modern fragrance um and um it's spicy, it's floral. There's a little bit of dirtiness to it. I call it a halitosis note. Some people don't like me saying that, but there is. There's something slightly dirty about it, let's say. Um, the reason that I say that is because it's a dirtiness unlike anything else I've ever smelled. Like if you smelled just civet on its own or castorium or whatever it is, skunk oil, you know, there's this sourness to some of them or there's this leathery um, ambriness to others, or there's this metallic vibe to castorium, or, you know, all of these different things. And here, the animalics are very strange, because yes, it's an animalic note, but it's almost like an animalic note where you've taken this powder and just dumped it all over it, you know, and you try to hide it with other things. You try to hide that animalic note, but it ends up making it smell different from any other animalic note you've ever smelled. But Jiki is a must smell for anyone who has a cursory interest in perfume. Anyone who has more than a cursory passing interest in fragrance should smell Jiki. Because Jiki is, um, it's it's almost like the foundation of modern perfumery. Many perfumes were built off of what Jiki did. And then in 1919, in 1919, they ended up putting out this little bad boy, Mitsuko. And I am in love with this version right here in particular. Um, my brother Cullen secured this for me. And oh, Mitsuko is, um, I mean, it's one of the greatest fragrances of all time, easily. But this is particularly the Parfum de Toilette, which these houses, they couldn't really agree on um, how, what they would call the Eau de Parfum in the late 80s. In the mid 80s, let's say in the 80s, but this could even be a late 70s bottle. I'm not 100% sure. I think Anuj told me this is a late 70s bottle. So let's say from the late 70s until the end of the 80s, the houses could not agree on what they would call the Eau de Parfum. Um, Guerlain called it Parfum de Toilette. Chanel called their Eau de Parfum um, Eau de Toilette Concentré. You know, and there's all these different versions. So YSL called their version Secret de Parfum. Dior called theirs Esprit de Parfum. Um, so, but it ended up working great for collectors because it's easy for us to go back and, you know, track this particular, you know, time period by the way that they were called. So the Parfum de Toilette, if you can find this or any version, any version, of Mitsuko Parfum de Toilette, get it. It is absolutely mind-blowing. Um, knock me four or six. One of the greatest cheapers ever made. Amazing. Uh, just the way the, the peach, the florals, ylang and lilac and rose and jasmine blends with that, you know, bergamot, which, you know, I'm often, uh, I often will say no one does vanilla like Guerlain. No one does this sort of sprightly bergamot opening either, like Guerlain. And then that spicy, ambergris, oak mossy, dirty dry down. It's just to die for. Uh, and I would say the same thing about... I also have the EDT, by the way. So I have the EDT, the Parfum de Toilette, and, and actually, now that I'm thinking of it... See? I would have forgotten one. I actually have this without a cap, too. The uh, Eau de Parfum, and this is a 2013-2014 bottle, which is 4T01, and many people say that Thierry Wasser went through a phase here in 2013-2014 where he tried to restore Mitsuko to its glory, basically, that these bottles smell very, very similar to the heavily sought-after vintage bottles. If you can find a 2013 or 2014 bottle of Mitsuko, 
Go for it. This stuff is out of this world good. Out of this world. Um, I, um, I completely, like, changed my entire thought process around perfume after smelling this. It is revolutionary. And um, Mitsuko is, uh, it's, it's really special. But I would say the same thing about Shalimar. So this is a parfum de toilette. There's no cap. I think uh, if you've watched Rudy, uh, Rudy, time to musk up is what he goes by. Excuse me. Time to musk up. Um, he has a bottle like this, but it actually has the gold cap that fits on top. So I don't have the cap that goes in this little holder, but the parfum de toilette of Shalimar is, is another Parfum de Toilette I would tell you to hunt down. Parfum de Toilette of Shalimar. I'd love to hunt down the Parfum de Toilettes of like Shemad and Le Bleu and stuff like that, but they're very, very hard to find. But I got this old EDT from Rich as well. Uh, Rich Mitch actually sold this to me. This came from the Ducks, uh, the, the Duck Den. And man, it's just unbelievable. And I also have, um, so Shalimar though, real quick. For those of you who are not familiar with Shalimar, the same thing I said about Mitsuko, if you have any, or Jiki, if you have a curse, any more than a cursory passing in perfume, try to get your nose on Shalimar because this is one of the greatest fragrances of all time. One of the most iconic fragrances of all time. For me, there's two historical iconic fragrances that vie for like the top spot, Chanel number no. five and Shalimar. And I'm a Shalimar guy. Like, uh, I, 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 uh, the vintage number five in Eau de Cologne, I'm okay with. I can stand it because it's a little dirtier. It has more of that civet and more of a vetiver like dry down. Many men actually wore Chanel number five in Eau de Cologne form. That's discontinued now. But the regular number five, like in Eau de Toilette with that heavy aldehydes and that floor, I really struggle with. But Shalimar is a completely different uh, beast altogether. And it's sort of the um, the uh, beginning of the Oriental style fragrances, if you will, for the West. Because remember, many fragrances were made like this in, in the East, in the Middle East, for hundreds, hundreds of years. Um, but Shalimar is sort of, ev everything comes together. The marketing, the, um, the, mo the bottle, the bottle is the most iconic bottle in perfume as far as I'm concerned. The actual Shalimar bottle, not, not the refills or anything like that. Just look up the actual Shalimar bottle with that blue cap that symbolizes sort of the gardens in the Taj Mahal and look up the backstory of, um, look up the backstory of, um, how the fragrance basically came to be. Uh, where it was the Emperor Shah Jahan and his beloved wife, Mumtaz Mahal, and he basically erected that monument, Taj Mahal, to symbolize their love, and that's what Shalimar is based on. Brilliant backstory as well. And then finally, and one and my favorite vanilla scent of all time, hands down, no doubt about it. Not, nothing else is even close. Nothing else is even... Shalimar is so far ahead that nothing else can even see Shalimar if they're chasing it. That's how far ahead Shalimar is for my favorite vanilla. And then we have Le Bleu. Le Bleu is, um, again, when you talk about fragrances that tell a story and that put you in a mood, there's very little that can compete with Le Bleu. And you can see how I've spent so much time on Guerlain because they really create this mood inside of me. You know, Guerlain is art art per perfume. Guerlain is perfume for people who love perfume is the way that I really think about it. And um, this is the Eau de Toilette. I also have the Eau de Parfum of Le Bleu in a refill bottle. Um, but Le Bleu is sort of that, uh, the, the blue hour. And, you know, if, if you think about that time at night when the sun goes down, but there's still light in the sky and... You know, there was basically a quote by Jacques Guerlain, which to me is the most iconic quote in all of perfume. Jacques Guerlain said that he felt something so strong inside of himself that he could not portray it to the world or display it to the world in anything else than a perfume. That was his saying. In more or less, okay, not a direct quote, but more or less, that's basically what he said. Imagine that. He's basically saying that... This is the only art form 
that I can portray what I'm feeling to you people. Um, that's pretty damn powerful as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and he's right. I mean, when you wear this, you, you cannot help but have your mood changed by it. And um, you also have to remember the time period that he set all this in. This was right before World War I. Lair Blue was 1912. So this is right before World War I. And he felt that the sun was not just setting on that day, but it was setting on an entire era, that everything was going to change soon. And he was right. Um, but it's just a, just a deep, thoughtful sin. And then, so we jump forward to the 80s. This is 1987. This is Giorgio for Men VIP Special Reserve. Hell of a name. Great fragrance. Aldehydes, cardamom, mandarin orange, bergamot, patchouli, vintage carnation, cedar, rose, sandalwood, cinnamon, and iris, benzoin, moss, amber, leather, musk, tonka bean, and vanilla. Fantastic stuff. Uh, Giorgio for Men, or or Giorgio Beverly Hills as a house. They had Giorgio for Men uh, from 1984, and then they had Giorgio for Men VIP Special Reserve from 87. You talk about a house that was firing on all cylinders in the 80s. Giorgio Beverly Hills was big stuff back then. Shame they've had such a fall from grace, but uh, those two are definitely worth buying. And then we're going to jump to the house of Trussardi. And Trussardi is an Italian house, and this is from 1995. This is Trussardi Luomo. Not Trussardi Uomo, which that's my favorite Trussardi from 83. This is Trussardi Luomo from 95. <coughs> Sorry. So this is Trussardi Uomo from 95, which is sort of this woody, fruity, tomato leaf fragrance. And it may sound strange to you, a tomato leaf fragrance, and it is strange, but um, there is something about that tomato leaf smell. So imagine like this uh, bitter herbal uh, tomato leaf that has this sprightly freshness about it. So the bergamot, the lavender, there's an herbal freshness around it with spicy notes, and then a base of patchouli and vanilla and tobacco and woods and stuff like that. I really like what this does. This might be... So this, there's two tomato leaf fragrances that go head to head. This, and um, What About Adam by Yelp. Uh, those are the two for me. Those are the two tomato leaf fragrances. That's it. Uh, that go ahead. I mean, obviously there's more, but for me, those are like the two big hitters and they're both done in the nineties. And then, um, probably the most underrated Nathalie Lorson creation, I would say he gets no love long discontinued, um, by the house of Trussardi from 2006. This is inside man inside for man. Excuse me. That's the technical uh, name inside for man. And I actually have two bottles of this and they're both testers with no caps. Uh, which again, when you're looking for hard to find discontinued fragrances, sometimes you have to just get what you can find. And, um, but I think both of them were unsprayed when I got them. So inside for man is uh, a woody, spicy, unique fragrance because it's got coffee beans and tobacco and there's a base of teak wood. And teak wood is a wood that uh, you don't see used very often in perfume. Teak is a very hard wood. And But what's so interesting about this fragrance is it opens up like a designer, but unsweet. So imagine drinking a Italian-style espresso coffee with zero sweetness and having a cigarette in the morning. That's the feeling of Trussardi inside for man. But it's in a designer you know, it's a designer fragrance. So there is a little bit, uh, as the fragrance continues to dry, it brings out a little bit more of this designery, slightly, um, you know, powdery. The coffee, the coffee bean slowly begins to change in the scent. And you do get a touch of sweetness into the dry down because Nathalie Lorson loves using cashmere, cashmere, cashmere wood. Um, and... But it opens up also with Japanese yuzu. I forgot about that yuzu note. And so this Japanese yuzu is there in the beginning, um, which 
was a very popular note to use in the mid 90s to mid 2000s. Um, it's a very expensive uh, ingredient, actually. Yuzu is a very expensive ingredient. Um, but Inside for Man, long discontinued, but if you like Nathalie Lorson's work, one of her best that is unsung, very few people talk about it. Chris from Scentland turned me on to, uh, to this fragrance, and he's right about this one. Okay, next on the list is a little baby tester, very hard to find. I'd love to get a full bottle. Uh, this is a full bottle, but I'd love to get a bigger bottle of this one day. This is Balenciaga's Ho Hang. So, um, I need to review this before the juice is all gone. Um, this is 1971. It's created by Raymond Shailan and Jacques Jensen. And Ho Hang is this woody, spicy... Um, so... Here's the thing. There were two fragrances in 1971 that both came out from Raymond Chailin. One was this. The other was YSL Pour Homme, the one that Yves Saint Laurent literally went butt naked on his advertisements to, to promote, right? And they both have similarities to me. When I smell both, they have some similarities to me. Um... They both have this citrus style feeling that was very popular with fragrances like Chanel Pour Monsieur and stuff like that, but they took them to the next level. You know, they took that DNA, which Chanel's Pour Monsieur was always a little bit boring to me. I know it's a very good fragrance, but it always just felt a little bit boring. I would love to try the vintage, the Chanel for, for men, you know, before they changed it to Pour Monsieur and see if that changes the way I feel about it, because I have a modern bottle of Pour Monsieur. Um, but here, it feels like they took that DNA and they just modernized it. You know, they added more things. So there's there's more to smell. And they made the base heavier. So, you know, they, you know, it's not just a sandalwoody base or whatever it is. There's rosewood, there's labdanum, there's some benzoin, vanilla, tonka, but you still get the focus on the citrusy top, orange and lemon and bergamot, and the citruses really do last. It's also slightly green, um, but I, I really like Balenciaga Ho Hang. Um, not my favorite style of fragrance, but one of my favorite executions of that style, if that makes any sense. It makes sense in my brain. I don't know if it makes sense to you guys listening. Okay, next on the list is a um, discontinued designer scent from Escada. This is Casual Friday. So, here's the thing. Casual Friday is goes for big money now. All Escada fragrances do. All of these discontinued Escadas. This is the big boy. This is the 125 mil um, tester. Again, I got this from Anoush. Um, he is the king of testers in my collection. And um, Casual Friday is this spicy sweet scent that Dominique Ropion actually created. And to me, you know, you have to think about what was popular in the mid 90s. It was Lamal, right? So this has this Lamal vibe. Imagine, but Lamal has that disgusting sweetness, right? So imagine if you could take Lamal and make it mature, right? Mature it up. Make it grown up. It has to go to work now. No more lying around on the couch all day. Get your ass out there and get to work, Lamal. And um, this does that because it opens up with anise, which is a vintage note, right? You think of things like Azara Porom, stuff like that. So there's a little bit of anise, and there's tarragon, which is one of my favorite notes. One of my hidden top secret ingredients is tarragon. And then you mix it in with that lavender, you know, that sweetness of tonka and vanilla and stuff like that. And But it's, it's cinnamony, it's spicy, and I do think, excuse me, um, it's... Um, it's a much better version of Lamal to me. I would wear this over Lamal any day of the week. I still enjoy wearing this, but uh, don't pay three hundred and fifty or four hundred and fifty dollars for a bottle of this. It's, it's not worth it. Even though Dominique Ropion's a fantastic perfumer, so this is what a designer scent should be. When this was being sold for thirty bucks, you know that's that's this is what a designer scent should be or used to be. So um, that is Casual Friday. Okay, now to some Caron fragrances. And the first one is Le Toise Homme, or Third Man, as it's known. This is what the original Le Toise Homme bottle looked like. And, um, you know, if you've seen the original uh, box, it almost looks like... Um, 
it almost looks like the image you would see on the top of a Polaroid camera or a piece of film. Remember when they used to sell film in the stores? Who's old enough to remember film being sold in stores? Um, and you know how it used to have that coat, that color, uh, you know, what would you call that? Where the color, almost like a color scale, right? And it goes from red, yellow, light blue, dark blue, purple, almost towards black, you know, and it, and it kind of just the colors change across the top. That's what the advertisement was on the vintage bottles. <laughs> and um, this is a, uh, this is a very well done aromatic fougere, a spicy aromatic fougere with a lot of clove. There's a brilliant clove note in here. The lavender oak moss, it's so, it's so um, classic, masculine. This is a high class fragrance to me. Very well done. Caron Le Toise Homme. And then here's a Caron fragrance that gets very little love in the community. And it was created by a couple perfumers. Um, sorry, one perfumer created this. And his name is Richard Frace. And Richard Frace gets very little love in the community. But I think this is one of his better creations that sort of gets overlooked a little bit. This is La Anarchiste. And you can see this is a tester. It's got the notes on the back. So hence no cap. Um, the cap on this bottle, if it had a cap, um, would have been almost a cap that's the same color as this bottle. You know, it has this um, bronze looking color, right? Copper looking color. And um, La Anarchiste is discontinued now, by the way, but came out in the year 2000. And so it's mint and orange blossom with bourbon vetiver and Indian sandalwood with gaiac wood and musk. Sounds like a very simple fragrance, but it's actually pretty complex for what I would consider a summery style fragrance because of the freshness of the mint and orange blossom. Um, the spicy woodiness of, of the fragrance, though. I really like what it does. I like how it changes. And it has this, you know, imagine like rubbing your hand on, on a penny and getting that copper feel right on your fingers uh, when you smell it. Imagine doing that with um, a little bit like a flame or something. So... Uh, I think the early advertisements of this, there was like a flame involved or something like that. I can't remember. But there is this feeling of, of like a warm metallic pot that, you know, um, that sort of rubbed off on the food or something like that. You know, there it's a, it's a very unique fragrance for a designer. And that's probably why it didn't do so well. It also, I mean, it survived long enough to go into the more modern... Uh, Caron bottles and then they ended up discontinuing it but spicy woody fresh with that mint and orange blossom one of the better orange blossom fragrances I would say okay next on the list is a Dior and this is the old school cologne version of Bois d'Argent so obviously sacrificed a cap for this bottle thank you Armando shout out to you my friend oh I I uh this fragrance basically uh, set the stage for the next 15 years of designers. I mean, Dior used this framework that Anique Minardo created, by the way. She used this, they used this framework to create Dior Homme. This set the stage for it with that Florentine iris. Ugh, with that iris and... Um, you know, it's, uh, for me, I, I would wear this mostly in the summer. I would wear Bois d'Argent in the summer. <laughs> it's powdery, woody. It's got a frankincense. There's a little bit of smokiness, but it, but it remains, uh, it's not super heavy. You know, it doesn't drag you down. Okay, next on the list, we have three bottles of Polo Green. Yes, three bottles of Polo Green. And one of them is the old school Warner. The old school Warner 
bottle, which is very hard to come by. Um, oh, this is what a man should smell like to me, honestly. And then I've got two bottles of Cosmere. And you can see Cosmere Canada. Thank you, Anuj. And this one, this is another Cosmere, but you can see it's a little different. It doesn't say Cosmere Canada. It says Cosmere in very small writing. So probably different distributors, different times. Um, this says copyright 1978, Ralph Lauren. Who knows? Who knows the... Uh, the different years and stuff, but you can see it actually says, this one actually says tester on the back. Uh, this one does not. I think this is the one that Bry sent me. I think Bry sent me this one. And I think it was Hari who sent me this one. I can't remember, but I think so. I think that's how it went. Because Bry got his from Anuj. And then he ended up sending it to me. In an, I actually bought some stuff from him and he sent me that for free. So thank you, Bry. Thank you, Hari. And thank you, Armando. Shout out to three people right there. So, Polo Green, though, from 1978 is, I mean, one of the greatest pine fragrances of all time. I love that leathery dry down. I just, I love the fragrance. It's what a man should smell like to me. That's why I have three backups of it. Um, and then, Polo Crest. And this, you can see, Tester. Um, and shout out to Anuj for finding this bad boy for me. Polo Crest is um, Polo trying to modernize Polo Green. So in, in the early 90s, 1991, they tried to uh, modernize Polo Green. And they took out the tobacco and a couple other things. They tried to make it a little bit fresher. It's still a, a Shepra. It's still a leathery Shepra, if you will. Uh, it still has that pine note. But uh, I think, you know, the OG from 78 is just the best version of it. Okay. Next on the list is going to be a discontinued uh, designer. I can't believe this is discontinued already. From 2016, this just came out. This is Le Mans Essence de Parfum. And Essence de Parfum, and this is the uh, 125 mil. I think I got this from fragrancebuy.ca for like 50 bucks or something, 40 bucks. Um, but Essence de Parfum, is a fragrance that people like me should hate. You know, it's got that it's got that designer sweetness to it. Um, but it has leather and osmanthus, two notes that I absolutely love. And so the thing about it is it has this tonka bean, vanillic, leathery sweetness, which if you've ever smelled fragrances like this, Carolina, Carolina Herrera Men, right? If you ever smelled this, this is another tester I ended up getting from Anuj. Or maybe not a tester, maybe just a partial I got from Anuj. Um, how it sort of has this sweet leatheriness to it, right? Um, this has some of that. This has some of that sweetness, but even more modernized because this is a Quintam Biche creation. Before Quintam Biche went off the deep end and just became Akigala Biche. Um... And so he 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 was still using some captive molecules back even even then, um, even in 2016. This has a note called Georgie Wood in it, and Georgie Wood is a scent molecule developed by Givaudan that has an intense, clean, woody like smell. And so um, very good designer though. If you like sweet fragrances, that's a that's a really good one to to try to hunt down. Okay, uh, next on the list, we have an Ungaro fragrance. And this is Ungaro Por Lom, the original, number one, from 1991. This is my favorite version of it. You can see the notes right there if you're interested in checking out the real notes listed on the fragrance. I will tell you that in the note breakdown, uh, the one note that is listed here that's not listed in Parfumo is honey. There's no honey note listed, and I think it really makes a plays a big part um, in the way that the fragrance ends up smelling. But this has a feel of an amber fougere, which is getting very popular in the early '90s. This is one year before Guerlain's Heritage, but it's in that same style, but with honey. Um, so good, 
the 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 best Ungaro fragrance. This and Ungaro uh, Pour Lome two are my two favorites, but um, three is good too. It's just it's just uh, you know. It's the only one that actually is still left, and it's the worst of the bunch, which is sad. <laughs> Apologies. Let's take a water break. Okay. Made it. Okay, next on the list is a fragrance from the House of Victor. Not Victor and Rolf, Victor. And this is called Wall Street. Again, I think this actually came from Anuj at Enchante. Um, oh, I love this stuff. If you like Polo Green, you should check out Wall Street. I mean, they're not the same. Um, but Wall Street, look at the, look at the packaging. Right? And... So Wall Street has this, um, imagine you are literally sitting in a boardroom. Ah, oh, this is a tester. Look, you can see right here, demonstration. There's a sticker right here. So um, Wall Street literally feels like you're sitting in a boardroom at Wall Street in the 80s, right? So I want you to imagine big car phones. I want you to imagine mahogany desks. I want you to imagine men smoking cigars in suits, uh, showing each other their business cards, like uh, Christian Bale from, um, oh God, American Psycho, right? Imagine that scene. Imagine some guy who makes a million bucks a year in the 80s, which is a hell of a lot of money, uh, and they are comparing business cards, right? Smoking cigars, comparing business cards. You can smell the mahogany wood. You can smell the leather in the Aston Martin. You can smell all that stuff, right? It's all there. And a vintage tilt, so you get that old school pine feel. Um, let's see if I can get the notes. Wall Street. Thank God for Ricolas, man. 1984, Wall Street came out. And it is Artemisia. Yes, you definitely get that, you know, deep greenness. Basil, lemon, bergamot, juniper, cedarwood, patchouli, pine needles, rose, carnation, cinnamon, jasmine, fir balsam, leather, amber, and oak moss. Definitely this leathery woodiness. Um... I love it. I uh, I absolutely love it. You know, it has that slight, uh, um, it has that slight polo green tilt to it because of the pine and leather. But again, modernized for for comparing it to polo green. Okay, next on the list is going to be a John Barbados fragrances, and I got a bunch of these when they went through bankruptcy for pennies on the dollar. I think I paid less than $20 for this, and this is a 125 mil bottle. Um, this is John Barbados Vintage. So Vintage came out in 2006, and um, it's probably one of the more popular fragrances from the house, although I have never smelled the new versions that Revlon is doing. So that's the one thing I will say is that these were marketed by EA Elizabeth Arden fragrances. Now, John Varvados is being marketed by Revlon. So I don't know what the new ones are like, but um, I can tell you that this is a pretty distinctive fragrance. It's juniper, white lavender, santolina, fir balsam, patchouli, jasmine, suede, tobacco, and tonka. And there's a little bit of this suede. -y, I think there might even be like a date note in here. Or, um, it's unique. It definitely is unique. And it's a Rodrigo Flores Rue, who I think is one of those perfumers who really makes the most of what he's given as far as ingredients and stuff like that to use. Um, he did a lot of the perfumes for the house Arquiste. And um, those are fragrances I really enjoyed. I've reviewed some from the house recently. Uh, I recently reviewed Nanban, which I really enjoyed. I don't think I'll be buying a bottle, but I definitely enjoyed it. 
and um, but you can see sort of the um, you can see sort of the skill that he has in making fragrances, even with these little cheapies, if you will. They're cheap in cost, but they they don't smell cheap, if that makes sense. Okay, next on the list is a Guerlain. Actually, I forgot to, I was going to bunch all the Guerlains together. I forgot this one. This is Abbey Rouge Dress Code from 2015. This originally came out. I think this is a 2017 bottle. So this is 7T01. So yeah, this is a 2017 bottle. So every year, they, um, <coughs> excuse me, they um, put out a new bottle for dress code. So 2015 was one bottle. 2016 was another bottle. 2017 was another bottle, so forth and so on. But it's the same fragrance in each ba in each bottle. So don't pay five hundred dollars for the twenty fifteen batch. Or do do not do that. If you're interested in this fragrance, get any bottle you can at the cheapest price you can. I think I got this from um, Mudasir, who's M Mudasir's on Base Notes. If you if you look him up, he's legit. Um, and Mudasir sold me this for like hundred and fifty bucks. That's fair. That's very fair. But these guys asking for five hundred, no. Um, and this is actually, I know a lot of times I make fun of fragrances that have like a praline or a tiramisu or something like that. You know, I'm like, those notes should not be in men's perfumery. This has a praline note and it is absolutely amazing. Probably one of my favorite, uh, gourmand fragrances of all time. I love dress code. It's, um, you know, it, it, uh, it's a it's a proper flanker of Abbey Rouge because there are bits and pieces of Abbey Rouge here. You get that bergamot, you don't get the rosewood, but you do get that leathery dry down and the spices and stuff like that. But it modernizes it with that praline and and one of the these are a couple of you know my uh, guilty pleasure fragrances, sweet fragrances that you would not think I like that I actually really do. So, but Abbey Rouge dress code is fantastic. Sad it's discontinued. Okay, next on the list is an Hermes, and this is Queer d'Ange. Um, I got this for under $100 because it was a tester, a demonstration, and for 100 mil, 100 bucks, steal. Absolute steal. That's the reason I buy stuff like this, because hell, I'll sacrifice a cap. What I love, the cap with the stitching on it and the, you know, suede feel, sure, but otherwise, I'm in it for the juice, so... As long as the juice is good, I'm sacrificing the cap. And this is basically leather and hawthorn are the two notes. Um, there may be more, but it's a Jean-Claude Elena. You get a little bit of that cumin bit you're going to come to expect from Jean-Claude Elena in the opening. If you've smelled things like Declaration or even his master's work, uh, which is Eau de Hermes, if you smelled stuff like that, you'll get a little bit of that in the opening. And then it transitions to a very... Um, I, I wouldn't say clean, but I would say pure. There's a pureness to this fragrance. It's literally queer d'ange. Angel leather is what that means. And so the way that it smells is like you're smelling a brand new white Hermes bag without any marks on it yet, right? Straight from the shop. And it hasn't been messed up yet. There's no scuffs, no nothing. It just has this clean newness to it. And that's sort of what it dries down to. But it opens up spicy and slightly challenging. But I love it. It's one of my uh, favorite Jean-Claude Alainas. Okay, next on the list is going to be a surprise for me. Because um, Armando talked me into uh, the fact that this was a real bottle. Because I had never seen these Frederick Malls that had the writing like this on the bottom. <coughs> Excuse me. This is what the original labeling of Frederick Mall look like. Uh, you can see the uh, 12.5 proof alcohol, 96 proof or 12.5% 12, 12 uh, alcohol, 96. I've never seen these Frederick Mall packagings before. I thought it was fake. I was like, man, this is the worst fake job I've ever seen. He's like, nope, that's actually what they were like when they very first edition of Frederick Mall. I said, okay, I'm going to go for it. And I did. I got this for a very good price because it's a partial. And um, this is Lipstick Rose, obviously. I've been showing you the bottle and didn't say it. But Lipstick Rose completely took me by surprise. I love this. One of my favorite rose scents of all time. It is so, so good. Probably my favorite Ralph Schwieger. Honestly, probably my favorite Ralph Schwieger 
fragrance. Uh, he's done other stuff that I like, like um, he did The Afternoon of a Fawn by Etro, which is very underrated. Um, but I haven't smelled a lot of his work. I haven't smelled Eau de Merveilles by Hermes from 2004. I have not smelled that. I have not smelled Phil's de Dui du Ritz et de Argums. Man, Etro needs to fix that. Um, I can't read that at all. I have not smelled any of the, uh, Aetis de Venustis fragrances. So there's a lot of his work I have not smelled. But from what I have, this is by far my favorite. Um, this is so intoxicating for, for me as a guy. Because it's like, literally, imagine smelling the lips of a freshly lipsticked woman. Imagine smelling the lips of every hot girl you ever wanted to kiss in high school and college and right it's it's all here and it's it's so playful and yet there's something so brilliantly classic about it that rose and violet combination um you know that makeupy powdery um creaminess it's it's brilliant you wouldn't think I would like something like this, but I love the execution of this is masterful. Ralph Schwiegel's Lipstick Rose. Okay, now we've got a couple creeds. So first, probably uh, my favorite from the Gray Cap Edition creeds that when they did EDTs, they put them in gray caps, and um, you know the uh, the gray caps were probably some of the best value fragrances Creed ever had. Um, the um, there were a couple. Uh, others that I've talked about on the channel, for example, Acier Aluminum. I have a full review of that on the channel if you want to check that out. Um, and and a couple others, which I have more to review as well. I just got to find the time. But this one is probably my favorite. It's Creed's Royal English Leather, which if you believe the backstory, this goes all the way back to like 1778 or something, which I don't think anyone believes that anymore, um, no matter how gullible they are. But uh Creed's Royal English Leather is basically bergamot, mandarin orange, amber, sandalwood, and, and leather. And so, a simplistic breakdown, if you will. But, uh, what it smells like is a sort of sparkling, fresh leather with an orange tilt to it. So, an orange, sparkly, fresh leather. And, um... That sparkly fresh leather and that very smooth sandalwood. Creed sandalwood is extremely smooth smelling. It has this, um, it has this uh, unbelievable milky, creamy smoothness, if you will. And, you know, it, that patented sparkly Creed ambergris, whether it's real ambergris or whether it's just salty ambroxan or whatever you want to call it, it smells amazing here. And the fact that this used to sell for a little over a hundred bucks retail, one twenty-five or whatever it was, um, it just shows how crazy Creed's prices have jumped, jumped, jumped. Um, but yes, Creed's Royal English leather. And then the next Creed that got sacrificed uh, for a cap is Venezia. Actually, I think this came from Anuj. I think he threw this in there with an order that I that I made. Um, cause I have a flacon of Venezia as well. And, um, but yes, this got thrown in there with an order, but Creed's Venezia is probably one of my favorite Creed's. I actually ranked my Creed's. If you want to check out my, uh, Creed family portrait, you can go check that out. This is bergamot, Bulgarian rose, sandalwood, ambergris, and vanilla. And it smells very similar to Shalimar. So it's Creed's take on Shalimar. And then... We have a flanker, another Guerlain that I put off to the side. I didn't do a good job of uh, putting these Guerlains together. This is Un Air de Samsara. So again, another tester and another bottle that comes from Anuj. Um, Un Air de Samsara is bergamot, jasmine, mint, narcissus, sandalwood. And so um, this is basically a flanker of Samsara called Un Air de Samsara, which did not get very much love. I think it got discontinued pretty quickly. Um, and there's a freshness here that is missing from the original Samsara. You know, I absolutely love the original Samsara, but sometimes it's hard for me to wear because it has this, um, you know, heavy floral aspect to it. This sort of takes some of that away. 
and adds this mint note, which you would not think would work, but damn it, it does. And the mint note here just adds this freshness to an overall flor floral oriental like fragrance. Um, really well done. Easily unisex too. I have no problem wearing that. Okay, next on the list is a Patou, a Jean Patou. And this is Patou Pour Homme. Obviously, I sacrificed a cap for one of the greatest masculines of all time. Um, this is Clary Sage, Mysore Sandalwood, Pimento, Virginia Cedar, Bourbon Vetiver, and Malabar Pepper. And that's it. People think Jean Patou Pour Homme is like some mind-blowingly complex, you know, creation. The greatest masculine of all time. It's not the most complex fragrance. Actually, it's a ridiculously simple fragrance. What makes it great is that Jean Carlio loved using things like Mysore sandalwood, real ambergris, real lots of real oak moss. Those are the things he loved to use. And those are the things that vintage lovers go after nowadays because, you know, where else are you going to get Mysore sandalwood? Where else are you going to find it? Uh, not very often nowadays, right? So that's why these just get, um, price, they, the prices just continue to keep going up. Very good, classy fragrance though. Best masculine of all time? Mm, no, I wouldn't say best masculine of all time, but a very good one. Staying in the house of Jean Patou, this is Sublime. Um, I ended up finding a vintage bottle of this without a cap and I, and I went for it and thank God I did because... One of the greatest floral sheepers of all time. I mean, honestly, no no kidding. These two are in the same category. They don't smell the same, but they're in the same category as far as complexity, quality of ingredients, storytelling. You know, who? what other perfumes can you put up against Mitsuko? You can put things like Diaghilev. You can put things like Rochas Femme. You know, what other Sheepers can you throw in there? Some might say YSLY. Some might say, you know, there's many, the Givenchy I showed, many, maybe number 19, which is coming up very soon. Um, but there's very few Sheepers that you can really throw in here. And with a straight face, say, you could go head to, you could go head, to head with Mitsuko. And Sublime is one of those. Honestly, it is. It, it really is sublime. Um, the, the florals in here, it's just the way it all comes together, the oak moss, this, there's a little bit of civet too, so it's slightly animalic. This is what a sheeper should be. It's got that bright bergamot opening. It just captures your attention. It's sparkly. And then the florals, the orris, the powdery orris comes in. There's so many little bits and pieces here. There's vetiver in the dry down. So it, there's a slight masculine tint to this and a slight feminine tint to this because the unbelievable florals. It's just Jean Carlio, man. I really think he's one of the greatest perfumers of, of all time. Okay, next on the list is a Jill Sander. And, and both of these I ended up getting without a cap. This is Jill Sander, Feeling Man. You can see right there, Feeling Man. And Jill Sander, Man. Same fragrance. Um, early on in the um, late 80s when this came out, uh, Jill Sander originally called this Feeling Man, I think. I think this was originally called Feeling Man. And then, I think they ended up um, changing it to Jill Sander Man, which is confusing because I think they already had a Jill Sander Man or a Man Pure or something like that. So it got a little bit confusing, but it, it's the same fragrance. If you see this bottle and it's, um, you know, the, the juice color is like this and the bottle looks like this, it's Jill Sander Man or Feeling Man. But it's basically a woody, spicy, this fragrance has that Jill Sander DNA. Go watch my Jill Sander review on background if you want to learn a little bit more of the house. But I'll do a full review on these one of these days. But this is Tarragon Lavender. See, with Jill Sanders, um, they're a house that sort of plays both ways, right? So you get, on one side of the coin, you get this modernity. On the other side of the coin, you get this uh, vintage old school vibe. And they play, they play um, at both 
brilliantly. To me, they do. Because, you know, you get a little bit of that anise, that tarragon, old school touches. But then there's like a modern raspberry note, which is like Jill Sanders. Um, it's like Jill Sanders DNA. And then, like, it's like a calling card of Jill Sanders, that raspberry note. And, and then what you get out of this fragrance, though, is this big dihydromersinol hit. So, you know, if you've ever smelled something like this, Dracar Noir, you'll get a lot of this sort of fresh uh, dihydromersinol feel here. But, but this is almost like an improved version of Dracar Noir to me. I know I said I love Pierre Wargnay and all his work, and I do. But I think this takes that DNA to the next level because they've added this spicy tobacco in the base. Oh, it's just, it's perfection. Um, love Jill Sander, man, or feeling man, whichever one you can find. Just get whatever you can find on that one. Next on the list, we have Bowling Green by Jeffrey Bean. And this is the cologne spray. They then turned it into an EDT. This has been long, long discontinued. They then turned it into an EDT, and now both are discontinued. So Bowling Green is a uh, old school fougere with pine and juniper, basil and artemisia and cardamom. And it's like this mossy, furry, cedary, um, classic, up and down classic fragrance. But I, I really enjoy this lovely sandalwood dry down. Sad it's discontinued. And then, one of my favorite fragrances from the 80s that not many people talk about, but I think it's one of the best 80s fragrances, it's Leonard Porhomme. And again, sacrifice the cap to have this bad boy. This is a tester. I've got some that are non-testers. They sold like little 25 mil bottles that are brilliant. I love those 25 mil bottles. This is spicy, woody, it's got lavender, thyme, bergamot, petit gras, basil, marjoram, Cinnamon, jasmine, patchouli, vetiver, iris, iris, artemisia, carnation, carrot, and that's an actual carrot note, not carrot seed, carrot, cedarwood, frankincense, leather, castorium, amber, moss, musk, labdanum. So the leather, castorium, iris combination is such a winner for me. Earthy, animalic, dark, challenging, but woody. And um, I, I love Leonard Poro. One of my all-time favorite 80s fragrances. Okay, next on the list is from the house of Yop, and this is Yop Om. I think Muda Seer threw this into a haul that I did. I can't remember. Um, but uh, I have a bottle that is full and not, not hatless. And um, uh, if you can find the older bottle that has the tree, little tree icon here and Om up top, um, and, and the new juice almost looks sickly pink, right? This is a good example. Look at the color of this juice. That is not the color of the modern Yop Om juice. Uh, this is, yes, it's a sweet oriental, but it's done by Michel Almarac and Pierre Bourdon. And, um, just the way the orange blossom blends with the heliotrope and that, you know, vanillic amber and cinnamon, um, you know, Creed did their take on Yop Om when they put out Creed's original Santal, uh, which I went through an entire bottle of that. I'm on my second bottle. So I've given this DNA a lot of wares. Okay, next on the list is one of my all-time favorites, top 10 designer fragrances of all time. This is Givenchy Gentleman. So Givenchy Gentleman is... Um, I mean, one of my for-life fragrances, if you will. One of my favorite honeys. Um... One of my favorite sort of honey patchouli fragrances, if you will. Spicy, leathery, and I ended up getting this one from, I forget, maybe Moudassir. I think Moudassir found this for me. But um, but yeah, it's a tester, and um, now I've got three bottles of this stuff. I never want to be without it. Spicy, uh, leathery, that patchouli, honey Probably, probably my favorite patchouli. Actually, I ranked my favorite patchouli fragrances to close out the year 2022. We did a live stream where we did the top 2022, top 22 fragrances um, of all time to close out 2022. And you can go see where this ranked in my countdown. 
And then we have some Chanel's and then we're done. So we've got Ego East in both the older style silver sprayer and the newer style black sprayer without a hat. Neither of these have, have a hat. Um, just a fantastic fragrance. This could probably be worn in the summer, the newer one. <laughs> Ego East is uh, known as like one of the best sandalwood fragrances of all time. It has that rosewood, mahogany, mandarin orange, coriander, cinnamon, carnation rose with that sandalwood and tobacco and leathery vanillic dry down. Ambery, leathery, vanillic dry down. Fantastic. And then number 19, this is a recharge bottle. You're supposed to put this in like something fancier to sort of cover it up, but I don't have that something fancier. So I just have the bottle. Um, and you can see right there, it's a green, woody, floral Shepra. And, um, number 19 is probably one of the best green fragrances ever made. Um, galbanum, hyacinth, iris, uh, rose, jasmine, ylang, that classic Chanel combination with lily of the valley and narcissus, oak moss, leather, musk, cedarwood, sandalwood. Um, I mean, the, I prefer the EDT personally because I think the EDT um, brings in more of that green galbanum, more of the uh, oak moss, less of the floral heart is basically what it comes down to. I get less of the floral heart in the EDT. The EDT highlights more of the masculine woody aspects of, of number 19. And finally, maybe my favorite hatless soldier, and I've got a backup, um, I absolutely love this. It is, um, it could be a signature scent on me. And uh, honestly, I could probably wear this every day and, and die a happy man. This is Chanel's Antaeus Sport. This is the Sport Cologne. And um, the Sport Cologne takes the original Antaeus DNA and changes it a little bit. It adds a peppermint note in the top and it adds a vetiver in the dry down uh, and it removes some things as well so it removes the myrrh from the OG um, and it, it removes a little bit of the um, of that uh, honeycomb you know what would you call it um, it removes a little bit of that um, that honey note if you will and it, it really allowed, but what it doesn't remove is the castorium. So that, that animalic castorium that you guys know I love so much, it's still here in the sport version. They've just made it easier to peer directly into the heart of this fragrance. Um, it's unbelievable. So thank God for Anuj finding me a couple bottles of this stuff because this is a signature for Ram. So Antaeus Sport is the final hatless bottle in my collection. Thanks for watching my weird little video idea. Sometimes I get an idea like this and I just want to do it. Even though you had to put up with me um, coughing in your ear and clearing my schnoz, but I very much appreciate you watching. Thank you for commenting and, and all the things you guys do to help the channel. Um, I really do appreciate your support. It's uh, I love doing these videos for you guys. It's uh, probably the best hobby I've ever had. And um, it's brilliant. It's brilliant stuff. One of the best, I think, the finest hobbies that uh, a man can have. Or a woman. And so, thank you very much for watching. Cheers, guys. Do leave a comment. We are still small enough where I can respond to every single comment. Leave a comment. Cheers. And I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.